Today we are going to discuss on respiratory symptoms. We have Dr. Rajini Bhatt with us. She is our faculty today. Welcome, ma'am. Welcome to our session. And here we have our sis Sheba sister with us, uh, our facilitator. I welcoming Sheba, ma'am, for a brief introduction of the faculty for today's session. Thank you. So, good afternoon to all. As uh, ma'am said, uh, today we are going to learn about uh, respiratory symptoms, which is very uh, common uh, symptom in palliative care. Uh, and uh, sometimes we are uh, very uh, facing very difficult to manage uh, in end of life care patients too. So uh, today uh, this session will be taken by uh, Dr. Rajni Bhatt. Uh, she is a pulmonologist and consultant physician. She has completed uh, her internal medicine and fellowship in pulmonary, uh, pulmonary disease and critical care medicine at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, New York. And uh, she also an elected member of government, uh, governing council, Indian Association of Bronchology. Her uh, areas of interest is uh, in the interventional pulmonology, medical humanities, palliative care, and end of life care. She is uh, uh, that uh, one of the uh, major faculty uh, uh, in palliative media right now. We are uh, trying to implementing palliative care in uh, pulmonology also. Uh, she is one of the active member and uh, um, we are very happy and uh, we are very lucky to have you here, ma'am. Um, welcome and over to you. Thank you, Shiva sister. Thank you for the very kind and generous introduction. Um, I'll just share my screen. So please let me know if this is visible to you. Yes, ma'am, please. Um, okay. So uh, thank you. Just go for the slideshow. It's okay now. Right, perfect. perfect. All right. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to uh, be with this wonderful group, which is taking on palliative care nursing. Um, and I'm sure you've had wonderful lectures from all the other faculty uh, as part of this course as well. Um, today, I'll be focusing on palliative care and advanced respiratory diseases. And you know, I, I like to approach it from a point of view of not just respiratory diseases, but respiratory symptoms in every other disease. Because what we've realized is that uh, patients with almost every chronic or progressive or advancing terminal disease uh, end up facing uh, distressing symptoms related to the respiratory system. So we'll go over, um, you know, what is the scope of palliative care in these disorders? Some of these are infections, some of these are chronic progressive diseases. Uh, it could be something which is an airway disease, it could be lung fibrosis, it could be cancer. But we try to try and understand what is the burden of breathlessness and other respiratory symptoms. Most of us are very well sensitized to the suffering that patients and their families experience with pain uh, and some of the other symptoms commonly that we are associating with uh, advanced cancer. Uh, that's something that we're sensitized to. That's something they're very cognizant of. But respiratory symptoms is something that they're only starting, you know, the world over the palliative medicine community has also started recognizing uh, the important role of alleviation of respiratory symptoms only in the last two or three decades. Uh, and there is still some resistance among us as healthcare professionals, as well as families and caregivers and providing the right care for patients. So let's explore those things a little bit. I'm sure you'll be able to find some application of the discussion that we will have today in your practice on a regular basis. So I'm going to, I know that we have a lot of participants today from many countries across the world, but I'm going to speak about just a background of the kind of burden that we have of respiratory disease in India. And this is, you know, a, a, a paper that came out in the Lancet in 2019, I believe. And it looked at the disease, the, the burden of respiratory disease in India. And what is shocking for us to recognize is that, you know, we are home to one sixth of the world's population, but we are also home to one third almost of the world's respiratory disease burden. Um, and this is a great fact, you know, it's a huge player in uh, the amount of disability adjusted life years because breathlessness is something that's an invisible suffering and it reduces our quality of life significantly. We look at the global burden of disease and COPD has now become the third leading cause of death in the world. So chronic obstructive pulmonary disease 
uh, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, all the names we used to know it by, but all COPD. It's the third leading cause of death in the world. And the five-year survival, we are used to looking at five-year survivals in palliative care with cancer. When we look at this, the patients live for, no, it's, it's a much higher number. But what this tells you is that you might have severe advanced lung disease and you will live with it for much longer. So your symptom burden is much longer for a much longer period of time. Um, we're also home to one of the largest numbers of new TB diagnosis, as well as the largest number of multi-drug resistant TB diagnosis. And this is a huge problem. It's a public health problem that we need to address. There are many other countries which have had similar problems, but have done a much better job of addressing the palliative care needs of this specific population. Patients with tuberculosis, with drug resistant tuberculosis, and their families and the community. So what can we look at in terms of what might be better models of countries which have better palliative and end-of-life care? How are they faring in terms of taking care of patients with lung disorders, breathing problems? So they're not doing too well, you know, and these are not very old papers. This is all within the last decade. So this paper in the European Respiratory Journal looked at Sweden, which has a very robust national health system, and one realized that when you compare COPD patients, advanced COPD patients who are oxygen dependent with patients who have advanced end stage cancer, the COPD patients' symptoms were not addressed as well. They had more breathlessness, more anxiety, more pain, more nausea, and their symptoms were not relieved because the SOS medications given for COPD patients were less. They were not given relief of symptoms. And this is the kind of misinformation or mis, um, misconception that we're trying to address now in our palliative care community, as well as the overall physician and pulmonologist community. So we've seen suboptimal care in advanced pulmonary diseases across the board in multiple countries, which have robust systems. Even when death is expected, these patients are not given referrals to specialized services. They're not referred to palliative care. They're not referred for hospice care. And um, they are more likely to die in hospital. Uh, so, you know, in palliative care, we speak often about what is a good death, that we look at what is a good life as quality of life, but we also look at quality of death. And we know that India doesn't fare too well in quality of death. But what we're seeing is that the world over, patients with respiratory disease aren't given the same attention for a good death, as we say, where it is on the terms that the patient chooses, that I would want to be at home. I would want to be not on ventilator. I would want to be with my family. In, in, in whatever shape or form the patient chooses, it should be the patient's autonomy, uh, their decision, their goals of care that we work towards. So even the more advanced healthcare systems have a long way to go in doing the right thing for patients with respiratory issues. Let's look at what are the respiratory issues that we face in our palliative care practice. So you might have palliative care in respiratory diseases. Now this could be respiratory symptoms. And then you can divide it into cancer and non-cancer. So I could be a patient with lung cancer or I could be a patient with an advanced lung disease like COPD or bronchiectasis or interstitial lung disease or lung fibrosis. So I would have symptoms related to the lung disease also, which would be breathlessness, cough, hemoptysis. And I could have symptoms which are non-respiratory symptoms, which would be pain, which would be nausea, which would be constipation, which would be sleep disturbance. And we also look at the fact that breathing symptoms will appear in every end organ failure. So if you have advanced neurological disease, you have severe Parkinson's disease, you're at risk for aspiration. So you're likely to have respiratory symptoms with coughing if you are a patient with advanced neurological disorder. If you are a patient with end-stage heart failure with a very low ejection fraction, you will be breathless. If you are a patient with end-stage renal disease who is struggling with dialysis, you will be breathless. If you are a patient with end-stage liver disease who has cirrhosis and end-stage liver disease, then you will be breathless. It's like the final common pathway for everyone in any progressive disease is breathlessness. 
we have to look at breathlessness and cough, which seems to be a universal complaint for many, many disease conditions. We also have to look at the non-respiratory symptoms that patients with chronic respiratory disease have. So we'll try to cover as much as we can of that in the brief time that we have today. So if we look at the respiratory symptom complex, you have breathlessness. Now this may be with or without hypoxia. This may be that your oxygen level is low and you're breathless because of low oxygen level. Or it could just be that your oxygen level is fine, but you are breathless because of an airway problem. Cough is a very bothersome symptom. It's one of the three most common symptoms for which any patient across the world seeks medical attention. The other thing is secretion. We have patients who have lung damage after tuberculosis. They end up with fibrocavitary disease. They end up with bronchiectasis. And they're constantly bringing up sputum and coughing. And it's very distressing to them. I haven't mentioned it here, but some of these patients also develop halitosis, really foul-smelling odor because of the secretions, because of colonization with bacteria. They don't have an infection, but they are colonized with bacteria. And that smell is so distressing to them and their family members. There's hemoptysis, one of the most scary symptoms that people can experience, which is coughing up blood. Um, and then, of course, we have airway obstruction with tumors. We have pleural effusions, either because of lung cancer, any other cancer, heart failure, renal failure, and respiratory failure, which is not being able to breathe. This could be because of a lung issue or it could be because of a brain issue as well. So neurological conditions can lead to respiratory failure as well. Many other symptoms that we see associated, I mentioned a few of them before, pain, nausea, constipation, anorexia, muscle wasting, sleep disturbance, dry mouth. When you're panting, you're breathing, your mouth is dry, you can develop ulcers. Anxiety, depression. Isolation because you're bound to your house and not able to move around or you're bound to as much as your oxygen tubing allows you. And then there's loneliness because you're isolated. And there's guilt because sometimes some of our patients feel it very intensely that they brought it on themselves because they might have had a smoking habit in their youth uh, or they may feel guilt because they're not able to fulfill their role in their family, maybe as the principal provider for everyone in the family. So there's many complex physical and mental and emotional symptoms that patients with respiratory diseases face. And the problem, I told you about the burden of respiratory disease, how common it is and how, what, a, what a huge problem it is in terms of disability in, in, in our communities, is that doctors tend to treat numbers, saturation, FEV1, CT scan, culture report. But they're not, they don't have either because they've not got the training or they don't have the time. They're not really listening to see what is it actually that the patient is suffering from. So you might listen to the chest and elicit those sounds that help tell you. But are you listening to what the patient is saying about what is distressing them, what is bothering them, what do they want out of quality of life? So this is an important piece. And I think this is where we work as teams together. Because when you have a respiratory therapist, when you have a nurse, when you have a doctor, when you have a psychologist, when you have a social worker, that is when the patient gets addressed, all of the patient's symptoms get addressed. So we really have to try and see that if one of these team members is overwhelmed by numbers and things, can we be the eyes and ears for them and make sure that the patient's concerns are addressed in our care plan for that patient. So let's start with one of the most common symptoms, which is breathlessness. Now, breathlessness, most people, um, it's difficult to understand how bad it could be. So I know some of you are familiar with it, but I'm going to lead you through a very brief exercise that will just be a couple of minutes. What I want you to do is find a comfortable sitting position and take a deep breath in. Inhale with me and... Breathe out, deep breath in again. Inhale and breathe out all the way out. Deep breath in and hold right at the top. Keep holding your breath, keep holding your breath. Now I can let it go just one third of the way. Stop there, in again, out again, just one third, in again. Out again, only one third. In again, 
out again one third in again and now you can breathe easy let go i want one of you to unmute yourself many of you is fine too but tell me what you experienced with this can one of you share with me what that felt like just briefly how did it feel in that one minute when i had you shift your breathing pattern and you were not able to breathe the way you normally do just i have a uh, good afternoon ma'am i have a uh, desire to exhale you had a desire to exhale you're waiting to exhale and i'm not letting you exhale right this is what a copd patient experiences because they are hyperinflated they have emphysema their diaphragm is stretched their ribs are out there it's and they are not able to exhale they are waiting to let out fully so they can breathe in again fully. and this goes on not for 2 minutes but for 24 hours a day 7 days a week 7 to 10 years of their life and it gets worse every time they walk when they walk to the bathroom when they try to catch a bus so imagine this this is what we are living with with breathlessness so it's an uncomfortable sensation there is for some people they are trying to get their breath in that's the interstitial lung disease patient for some they are trying to get their breath out and it's an unrewarded effort i am trying my best to breathe well and i'm never feeling rewarded by it what this does the strongest instinct within us is an instinct to survive it triggers a survival you know of a panic and a fear about survival in us and this is what builds up over time in our mind okay now this may not correlate always with disease severity we will see patients who have very bad lungs and they look very comfortable because their bodies have adapted over time as opposed to somebody who's had a sudden thing happen to them like you've had a rapidly growing thyroid tumor which is compressing your airway the body hasn't had time to adapt unlike a copd or an ild patient where the disease has been slowly progressing so they will experience severe panic severe discomfort even with far less obstruction now all of this is stuff we have learned in the last two decades because unlike pain research you know pain research has been on for half a century but and more this near research is just a couple of decades old but we have learned a lot from the models that we've got from the pain research um so if we look at it in that sense you know there are there are pathways that we've now identified so we understand breathlessness much better as something which is happening at a physical level based on your physiology so that might be your age your gender um uh, the the physic the pathophysiological condition you know whether it's heart failure whether there is copd whether there has been weight loss and muscle deconditioning there's also certain emotions which play on it so that is about whether there's fear and anxiety whether there is other symptoms added on like pain and we've started looking at it in the same way that we look at total pain in dame cicely saunders model that this is a symptom which you could look at it in the way that you look at pain that there's a physical element to it there's a social element to it there's an emotional psychological element to it and there's a spiritual element to it as well so i would suggest that you look at it from all these ways that how is our brain processing it what are the card what are the pathophysiological changes that are happening how much of it is expected you know for a pregnant woman as the diaphragm rises i will expect a little more breathlessness but is it out of proportion as what they're looking for what is the physical context and how can we try to adjust that to make them feel better how can we work with what are known emotional triggers to help them cope better with their physical uh, with the breathlessness so these are all the things we'll keep in mind when we look at ways of solving the problem of breathlessness i'm just sharing this one study here which was my entry point into understanding how much more we could do for patients with breathlessness so this is a a remarkable study not very large numbers of patients like most studies on breathlessness but this is what professor irene higginson's group at kings college london at the dame cicely saunders institute and they looked at patients who had advanced respiratory disease who were on oxygen and they looked at a breathlessness intervention or a breathlessness support service which helped the patients with better coping mechanisms for breathlessness and those who did not receive this intervention what they saw was that the patients in the intervention group had less emergency room visits had less hospitalizations uh, were more likely to spend the last of their days at home 
more importantly you also see a survival benefit now there are very few medicines pharmacological means available in the world these days which help patients with chronic respiratory disease have a survival benefit but here is a simple intervention which is primarily requires more of palliative care nursing respiratory therapy which can be taught to family members rather than any doctor in medicine and it has a powerful impact so this is what we need to start looking at more the non pharmacological management of breathlessness which includes physical rehabilitation and exercises which includes the judicious use of oxygen and non invasive ventilation like bipap or cpap which includes the use of a simple device like a handheld fan and then if those do not work then we go to opioids and other medications which can help with breathlessness and we also understand that there could be a role for alternative therapies to address certain aspects of breathlessness which is the anticipatory breathlessness which is the psychological aspect of that so now after a long time there is a consensus towards recognizing chronic breathlessness syndrome so it is where we understand that there is a distress and disability which persists despite optimal medical treatment of the underlying pathophysiology so say i have copd and i am on the right inhaler if i need bipap at night i am on bipap if i am supposed to be on rehab i have got my rehab i'm doing everything i can and i'm still breath this is chronic breathlessness syndrome this is a refractory breathlessness and this needs a breathlessness intervention which is what we will address so when we look at a breathlessness support service we are looking at asking the patient how does it affect their life it's not just what is the ct scan showing what is the lung function test showing what is the oxygen saturation but they're looking at their understanding of what is this breathless is doing to me in my life how aware are they of their maladaptive breathing patterns you know sometimes this the the intuitive thing that people do is to hyperventilate and that's the wrong thing we know in copd what they need to do is to learn to do long slow exhales with pursed lip breathing so very often awareness of breathing inhale exhale just teaching them awareness helps them to learn the better patterns of breathing how aware are they of their movement and patterns very often our patients with breathlessness are people who are used to being on the get go you know you will have a lady who is the strong matriarch of the house who's running everyone like okay she is the master of the kitchen she is the one who's making sure the kids are getting to school on time and suddenly she develops a disease which is slowing her down she is used to doing things at top speed she cannot slow the speed of her legs down but that is making her more breathless so how can we help them with learning pacing so she reduces her speed just enough so that she will not get breathless so she can do more and be more independent handheld fans distraction and relaxation therapies and exercise these are the most important pillars on which most breathlessness support services hinge on and this came from this model of breathlessness which was de de developed in the came at, at cambridge by dr anna spatis and sara um, sara boot and this i would like for all of you to think about how you will apply with your patient so there's three key aspects that we address in breathlessness it's breathing thinking and functioning so there are things that we spoke about inefficient breathing so if i'm just trying very hard to breathe take in a breath take in a breath and what i need to do is do long slow exhales so what we try and tell patients to do is to find a rectangle it's called rectangular breathing where you just find a rectangle and just look at the screen of whatever device that you are using and say breathe out on the long side of the rectangle just automatically breathe in on the short side breathe out on the long side again automatically let air come in on the short side so if you do when a patient is in distress you ask them to look at a window you ask them to look at a door you ask them to look at their phone a book they will find a rectangle somewhere which they can focus their gaze on and then learn how to breathe in the rectangle to slow their breathing so these are simple ways we can use right so this will help with the dynamic hyperinflation so first lip breathing breathing in a rectangle these are things that are useful thinking you know when we look at pain scale we look at what's the worst pain that we think of on the pain scale i'm going to pass out that's my 10 out of 10 what is the thought that comes in a person's mind when they are not able to breathe 
I'm going to die. So it is a catastrophizing thought which is much higher than the worst pain that you can imagine. You know, when we say the worst pain, it's like I'm going to pass out. You might say I'm going to die, but it's not threat to life that your actually your brain is actually perceiving. It's saying I can't be conscious anymore. I can't tolerate this pain anymore. I will be. I will fall unconscious. But when it comes to breathing, the fear that's triggered in your mind is I'm going to die. If you've experienced this breathlessness once in your life, which is a severe breathlessness that you think you might die, any time, any other time that you are in a similar situation again, it triggers a panic response and you automatically start anticipating pain. It's very similar to a patient who has a bad burn wound where you're going to do dressings and they develop anticipatory pain. And that's why we give them pain medication before we do dressing change. So the same thing happens for patients with breathlessness. When that first part of the breathlessness starts, they think this is going to be the same as the last time where I nearly passed out. I had to go to the emergency room. I had to go to the ICU. I had the worst time in the hospital. My family had to spend so much money. So their thoughts are going to race all the way through that. So the way we help them do it is to break that chain of thought by saying, I know the techniques to get out of it. I know the breathing techniques to do to help me get over it. This has happened to me before. I got better before. I will get better again. We'll teach them how to break that cycle of anticipatory breathlessness, anxiety, and panic-stricken thoughts that will worsen the breathlessness. The third piece is functioning, very important. Typically, what happens to our patients is because of breathlessness, their families will try to keep their breathlessness under control. So they'll say, Mama, you don't do this. They'll say, Daddy, you don't do this. You don't go. I'll do it myself. They will do everything for them. And this is a little misguided. They're doing it because they're afraid that mommy or daddy is going to fall or is going to you know, end up in more trouble. But at some level, they will get more deconditioned and that will lead to further breathlessness. So this deconditioning, all of that is very, very problematic because as they stop doing things, they become more breathless. So we have to teach them how to cope with breathlessness. And the way to do that is to teach them pacing, to slow down their speed at doing things, to take breaks. If I am walking to the bathroom, my typical patient will be like, I will put off going to the bathroom until I cannot control it anymore because I don't want to walk because I'm afraid of breathlessness. Instead of that, I have to tell them the first time you think I need to go to the bathroom, walk slowly, take two breaks, take 10 steps, pause, take 10 more steps, then go to the bathroom, then come back in the same way, three pauses on the way. You might have taken two minutes more, but you did it on your own. And you didn't collapse on the way. So pacing becomes important. Using a handheld fan is very, very useful. So we just teach patients to use a spray or a clean wet cloth, wipe your face with it and put a handheld fan, fan in front of your face. What this does is it stimulates the trigeminal nerve here and it sends a message directly to the breathing centers to slow down our respiratory rate. And we are able to do the better adaptive breathing rather than the maladaptive hyperventilating kind of breathing for better, right? So all of these are techniques that we use. So we teach them how to build up slowly. They have to keep up with physical activity. Nowadays, many patients have a smartphone. So they'll be able to do step counters. Or if it's a small space, you tell them to walk up and down in their room. How many rounds did you do? How many circuits did you walk? And you will realize that when they learn pacing, and they learn to pause and pace and breathe right, gradually over time, every two weeks, they will increase the number of steps they are able to walk by 15, 20%. So this makes them more able to cope with the breathlessness. This is more about living with breathlessness than eliminating breathlessness. So we accept our lung function may have come down. We accept breathlessness is there. But we accept also that we will get mastery over breathlessness. Breathlessness will not control us all the time. So these are certain positions, and I know most of you will be familiar with it. But when we encourage patients to get more mobile, they will have episodes of breathlessness. So you tell them that when breathlessness happens, don't lose heart. You know, do the forward position, leaning forward, do rest against the wall or a sideline. And then do the simple breathing that will help you to get over that episode of, episode of breathlessness. 
try again maybe after a few hours or the next day but this is how you tell them that you are going to face it but you will also learn how to recover from it it's very important that we distinguish a couple of things so if patients have asthma copd bronchiectasis then they might need bronchodilator nebulizations and they might need also chest clearance for postural drainage for future but there's one kind of airway problem which is rider which is when they have an inspiratory sound and it's important for us to recognize especially if you're dealing with cancer patients who might develop airway issues because then we hear the whistling sound not on the out breath but on the in breath so strider sounds like <gasps> as opposed to wheezing which is <gasps> so strider is the inspiratory sound of not being able to take a breath in usually it indicates an airway obstruction which is in the larger airways and the things we use for that are usually going to be non invasive ventilation or there are new interventional pulmonology techniques that are available so nowadays depending on your center you might have access to an interventional pulmonologist who can open up the airway tumor right in the olden days we used radiation or we used um, brachytherapy which was leaving a catheter inside for doing focused radiation in the area of the tumor but nowadays we ablate we ablate the tumor we debulk the tumor by mechanical means and we also place in stents what this does is it helps the lung to remain open if it was getting blocked by a tumor prevents the post obstructive pneumonia but yes you have a hardware piece inside a tube so you have to teach them sputum clearance so you have to teach them how to do nebulization and sputum clearance so these are all the techniques that you would be used to using for helping people breathe right we use nebulizers we use oxygen delivery system nebulizers inhaler with spacer a mouth held nebulizer versus a face mask nebulizer all of these are the different modalities you can use for little children we use a spacer device if we are giving them an inhaler with a face mask as well and when it's oxygen delivery we use nasal cannula we don't go beyond 5 to 6 liters on a nasal cannula and even stop at 4 to 5 liters because it becomes very dry if it is that you are using nasal cannula make sure we giving them also some saline nasal drops to keep their nostrils not so dry if it's going with a higher flow rate then we switch to masks and venturi masks and if it is a higher flow that you require then a non rebreather mask is required remember that when we are using a non rebreather mask the oxygen flow either from the wall um uh, wall supply of oxygen or from a concentrator has to be at 10 to 15 liters um so who requires the oxygen patients with severe copd or ild who have hypoxia so some patients will require long term oxygen uh, based on insurance reimbursement is where these criteria were set down rather than major science studies but sometimes some some countries will use an abg value some countries will use that if you have a baseline saturation under 90 or if there is a drop in oxygen saturation when you walk then we prescribe oxygen to patients i suggest that we always give long tubing so that they can walk around a little more and in always add humidification with good advice for how to change the water in the humidification changer it's very important that we address emotional issues with oxygen you know people tend to associate oxygen with all kinds of negative connotations they don't like to be seen with oxygen so um they look at it as a disability they look at it as weakness and we try to tell them that oxygen is like a wheelchair that is allowing you mobility oxygen allows you to go out and lead a social life the only thing of course is that you can't be actively smoking if you have home oxygen and we have to watch out for fire hazards but it's important to work on if a patient is saying no to oxygen when they actually need it why are they saying no is it because they're embarrassed to be seen by it seen with it is it because they think they become the center of attraction other people are saying oh no it's so sad you're using oxygen so also helping them overcome those psychological barriers and building the right support structure around them who will say come come let's go with the oxygen let's go for that you know prayer meeting or let's go for a music session or whatever but finding that support for using oxygen within the patient's community next we come to cough very very distressing symptom again multiple pathways in which it is triggered sometimes it's just a pure reflex a protective reflex response 
sometimes it is also a central issue with a neurogenic cough that can be so multiple pathways are there for addressing cough if it is coming due to an infection due to an airway disease then we treat it with antibiotics with nebul with bronchodilator nebulizations some of these need inhaled corticosteroids some of these need anti allergy medications sometimes it's because of acid reflux disease and sometimes it's because of certain central um, issues in the neurological pathway of path, uh, of cough so we have to look at the cause of the cough if we're not able to figure out you know typically one history is that as soon as you lie down and after meals if there is cough then we suspect acid reflux uh, and then we give dietary advice postural advice um so it's important that we look at all the possible ways in which cough is happening and one area which is not used as much is speech therapy and the right breathing techniques for cough unfortunately we don't have too many speech therapists who are very proficient in treating cough but this is an area where more and more of us are paying more attention to looking again at non pharmacological means of addressing cough so one thing i would like to say cough patients end up with a laundry list of medications it's important to keep in mind that many of these cough suppressant medications also cause constipation also cause other symptoms so if we have patients with us under palliative care we have to make sure that anything that we are giving them does not add to other symptoms as well and alleviate that as well secretions is distressing some of these can be just oral secretions you know because of aspiration so those are type 1 secretions typically in neurological patients the others are type 2 which is coming from the tracheobronchial tree so that's the mucus or that is the purulent sputum that is being produced um so the way we address both is different if it is because of a hyper secretion then we might look at anti secretory mechanism otherwise if it's because of an over production then i don't want to suppress that secretion you know we'd much rather work at ways of helping them bring that secretion out so we look at secretions in similar ways that we look at pain we look at when it started the onset the provoking and palliating features what is the quality of the secretions what color is it how thick is it what's the region it's coming from is it originating from a post nasal drip is it oral secretions is it coming from the tracheobronchial tree and how do we treat it is it responding to the treatment and understanding how the patient's habits are and value systems again about cough is very important okay because um there are certain things associated with cough which are cultural which we need to keep in mind um also very you know sometimes we treat secretions more for the distress of caregivers there is a term which was in use earlier which we do not use anymore i'm just going to reference it so we know so these are loud noisy secretions towards the end of life it used to be called the death rattle but that term death rattle is a very insensitive term so i'm just going to say loud noisy secretions at the end of life instead if the patient is comfortable we do not need to treat it we just need to explain to the family member look at the face look at the body of the patient and see the patient is not in distress it's okay right but if the patient appears in distress then we need to address those secretions whether it is with suctioning or giving medications like lycopyrrolate to reduce the secretion um we also need to mobilize secretions in some patients patients with neurological disorders need assistance with clearing secretions patients with bronchiectasis and cystic fibrosis need assistance so they need to have mucolytics they need to have effective cough strategies to help them cough up and bring out the secretion so that's another aspect of our care when we go examine patients when we do suction for patients with tracheostomy we need to record what is the nature what is the quantity what is the color of the secretion when that changes that helps us to decide whether it might be that this patient is too dehydrated sometimes it's as simple as that the patient is too dehydrated that's why they have thick secretions they need more hydration so if overall the patient is looking dehydrated they just needed hydration however if the patient is having a lot of secretions because they are fluid overloaded they are in heart failure we have clear whitish pinkish frothy secretions coming out then that patient needs diuretic so this is how looking at the quality of the secretions those uh you know severity onset provoking quality all of those things comes into play for us to decide how to manage and postural drainage most of you are familiar with this how do we work at helping patients bring out the secretion um if any of you has adopted any of these you know positions where the head is low it can be quite uncomfortable so 
um, when we are doing this for patients, I always suggest that you make sure that there is some kind of cushioning so that the patient's position is comfortable before we do the chest therapy and help them with the postural drainage. Um, chest therapy can sometimes be painful. So we have to be mindful of that uh, and make sure that we uh, keep checking in with the patient. Are they comfortable? Are they okay with it? Uh, there are new devices that are available in India. We don't have the West for doing the chest percussion, but we do have cough assist devices used mainly in ICUs. We have the acapella device and the, uh, 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 there are a couple of mucus clearance devices in the market. These cost around three and a half to four and a half thousand rupees. We use them for patients with bronchiectasis and teach them how to use it. So we teach them how to do nebulization, follow it up with the acapella device. It helps them to clear the secretions, reduces their cough during the day, improves quality of life by doing that. These are some more of the aids that we use to help patients cope with their respiratory symptoms. The handheld fan, like I mentioned to you, it's available. I would suggest a battery operated fan, which is about this big, you know, like six, seven inches, no more than that. Three blades is better than two blades. You tell them to hold it 15, 20 uh, centimeters away from their face. Um, that's a step counter device that you see in the center top. There hmm. are rollator walkers, which help to walk. Walkers so that the patient can walk using a walker um, to help COPD and ILD patients start walking around more. Patients who are on NIV for long periods of time sometimes develop nasal bridge ulcers and pain. So there is a gel pad which is available for placing over the nose. It distributes the pressure more evenly. So then they don't develop that painful ulcer. So simple little things can help our patients tolerate the devices much better. When it comes to hemoptysis, very distressing symptom. Um, you know, if it's mild hemoptysis, not as distressing. So we just give cough suppression. We don't give any nebulization. We don't want anything that will irritate the airway and make them cough more. And we can give them tranexamic acid. Some people use it, amsalate as well. So IV or oral tranexamic acid, typically we give 500 milligrams three times a day. That can help with reducing the hemoptysis. If the patient has larger quantity of hemoptysis, a mild anxiolytic or opioid, you know, just giving a very small dose of morphine or codeine, a cough suppression, you can use codeine as well, uh, helps in reducing the cough and also the anxiety that comes on with seeing blood. The further intervention, whether they are going to interventional radiology for a coil embolization or for some kind of an airway spigot treatment or surgery, if it means a lobectomy for the patient, will be as per the goals of care, depending on how advanced the disease is in that patient. The simple thing we can do is if the patient is continuously coughing out a lot of blood, just change the bed sheets to a dark colored bed sheet. So the distress of seeing blood, dark towels, dark bed sheets, at least that anxiety and that absolute distress of watching yourself exsanguinate in front of your eyes and for the family members, that distress comes. Pleural effusions are very distressing uh, and most of the time they require drainage if they are recurrent and rapidly filling up. Uh, so for malignant pleural effusions, patients will sometimes have chest tube. It's important to know how to take care of chest tubes. Nowadays, we have, uh, sometimes we have to send patients home with a drainage bag. And nowadays we also have newer devices which are called Plurex catheters, indwelling catheters and newer procedures available. What we have to keep in mind is there significant pain at chest tube sites? You know, someone's gone in between your ribs and put in a tube, it is going to be painful. So I often find that uh, we tend to under-medicate patients' chest tube pain uh, because they're worried about respiratory depression. But even without opioids or with, uh, you know, weaker opioids, we can manage to get reasonable control of the pain uh, with the chest tube. So these are the newer type of devices that are available, whether it's an in, a chest tube, intercostal drain, or it's indwelling pleural catheters like pleurex catheters. Another issue that comes up is aspiration for which uh, people require tracheostomies and pegs, typically seen more in neurological disorders, patients with stroke, patients with motor neuron disease or Parkinson's may require it. Uh, there are very standard guidelines for when we use it. Even uh, younger patients, you know, patients with cerebral palsy.
Hello, ma'am. Rajini, ma'am, can you hear us? Difficulty. Hello, are you able to hear me? Yes, oh, yes, ma'am. Ma okay, sorry, I just got a call which disconnected my line for a second. Oh, okay, ma'am. Please yeah. continue. So, so I think it's important to keep in mind that we make the call about PEG early rather than when the patient has become very malnourished and has had many, many bouts of aspiration pneumonia. So it's a discussion about goals of care that we have to have with the family. Acute emergencies, every family should have a plan for acute emergency. What am I going to do if there is a worsening? Do, is this a patient who has had repeated hospitalizations? Do they want to go to the hospital? Do they not want to go to the hospital? What's the immediate care? If it's a patient with a tracheostomy at home, what's the immediate care the family caregiver can do? So these plans should be explained to any patient who has chronic respiratory problems and tends to have acute exacerbation. So, you know, the way they will go through their step-wise checklist of is the oxygen thing connected? Do I have a spare backup oxygen cylinder? Do I need to give a nebulization? Do I need to bring the handheld fan? How do I help the patient get into better position? Acute emergency, any emergency medications to be given right away. How do you call for help, whether it's a home visit or it's going to be go to the hospital, to the ER. You should have a plan for acute emergency. Very important to pay attention to nutrition, a high protein diet. Fluids is something that depends on, as I mentioned earlier, whether the patient is dehydrated or fluid overloaded. Anabolic steroids and appetite stimulants are actually useful, uh, especially for patients who are now who go into muscle wasting. So muscle wasting and weight loss is a bad prognosticator for patients with COPD, ILD. When they start losing weight, it means that they are going into advanced disease. So we do try anabolic steroids um, sometimes uh, if it can help them get better quality of life and prevent or slow down the muscle wasting. Make sure we address all GI symptoms. A lot of patients who are on oxygen, BiPAP will have bloating, will have constipation. So uh, we try to make sure that their bowel movement is regulated for dry mouths because, again, they tend to breathe through their mouth if they're breathless. You know, Sugar-free candy, I say, you know, something sour like, you know, lemon drops or some people keep elaichi, cardamom pods in their mouth. Something to just keep the saliva flowing. And if it's very severe, then we give pelocarpine. Pain is the same as always. We work our way up the WHO pain ladder. Opioids, if necessary, at low dose and monitor. And again, for pain, the non-pharmacological means is very important. Using ultrasound, TENS, IFT, massage, mindfulness, all of those things are useful ways of dealing with the pain. So we have many things we can use before we get to opioids. If the pain is severe, it should be addressed. We should not be afraid of opioids for patients with COPD. We should address their sleep disturbances. Um, using melatonin is useful for patients with COPD uh, because if one is again, if they have carbon dioxide retention, people are afraid to use opioids, melatonin is useful. Um, I'm gonna skip this because tuberculosis is a long complicated thing, but suffice it to say that every country needs to address the palliative care needs of the patient community who has drug resistant tuberculosis. We need a lot more effort on this. So um, it's important that we address the health-related quality of life. So decide what is important to the patient and what are their goals in all these symptoms and try to help them achieve as many of their goals for health-related quality of life. Have to get over opioid phobia. Opioids reduce that air hunger and they also help to reduce that anticipatory breathlessness and that feeling of panic. So the most evidence is in patients with COPD. What we know is what works is low-dose sustained release morphine. So low-dose sustained release morphine is what one uses. In our country, in many places, we don't have sustained release morphine. In that case, we use regular doses of small doses of an immediate release. So we use 2.5 milligrams to 5 milligrams of immediate release morphine every six hours or so, and always with a bowel regimen. What about end-of-life conversations? When you see a patient getting admitted repeatedly, then you know that this is time to have that conversation about what would they want, what would their wishes be? Have they had a loved one who has, you know, uh, had a severe illness? There are many ways of broaching this conversation, but if they have oxygen dependence and more than one hospitalization, then we need to start looking at it. Um, 
and the key issues to ad address is ask the patient what's important to them where do you think it's a good thing where do you think is the best place to be at the end of our life they will tell you that's a way of figuring out that conversation uh, and delving further into their wishes for the end of life patients caregivers go through a lot because patients with advanced respiratory disease as i mentioned have high symptom burden for long period of time there's a lot of stress lot of burnout that caregivers go through they need to be prepared educated on how to deal with acute emergencies and also to prepare them for the end of the life of their loved one and they need to be provided bereavement counseling assure them that you've done the best that you can um and this is what i say on some days you know you'll have good days and bad days for patients some days they'll have good days when they're able to do things they are able to you know help cook a meal for a festival or bake a cake for someone's birthday on other days all you're able to do is breathe and it's okay but it always helps to know what drives the patient what kept them happy what do they miss from the time before they were breathless and try and find ways for helping them to be able to achieve that in some small shape or measure so helping patients find a mantra that we tell them to be able to be still be calm to be able to bring those tight muscles down to be able to breathe out to be able to say and slowly gain control of their breathing again this is the best gift that we can give to our patients who have chronic breathlessness and advanced respiratory symptoms and with that i come to a finish uh and i believe there's a case presentation i'm sorry i think i ran a little low over time but i will be happy to take all um uh questions thank you ma'am uh, for the excellent presentation uh, any any questions there's a question in the chat box about why would you give tranexamic acid that's in the case of hemoptysis so when a patient is actively hemoptysizing at that time we give them tranexamic acid it helps to control the excessive bleeding usually we might need to use it for a day or two sometimes when they are hospitalized we'll give it to them iv uh, as i mentioned 500 mg three times a day and we discharge them on oral tranexamic acid which then once the hemoptysis stops they can stop so usually it's a three to four day course along with antibiotics if they have a bronchiectasis exacerbation which is what precipitate sometimes you know you have patients colonized with pseudomonas with bronchiectasis so when they have the exacerbation they will have hemoptysis as well if the patient's bleeding has stopped and if he was on nebulizer stopped give him anti bleeding yeah if he is on nebulizers we stop the bleeding uh, we stop the nebulizer at that time imagine that patient with bronchiectasis having exacerbation or a copd patient having exacerbation or a lung cancer patient having bleeding at that time you don't want to give the nebulizer because it will be a protussive medication so you give the cough suppressant like a codeine uh and you also give if if there is something like an obstructive lesion you might give steroids if there is a copd or an airway obstruction which is a dynamic airway obstruction you can give steroid at that once the bleeding active bleeding stops you can restart the nebulizer Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, can we move on to the next presentation now? Yeah. Uh, would uh, Would Ms. Kusum like to share the screen, or would you like me to share that screen on that? We will share. We will. You will share. Okay. Kusum. Hello. Good afternoon, ma'am. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, ma'am. Uh, today my case presentation. Uh, is like C A lung patient. Next slide, please, ma'am. Uh, my patient was sixty-four year male patient who was a known case of known small cell uh, carcinoma of left lung with metastasis so into brain and T uh, T twelve vertebra. So it's almost like a stage four cancer, advanced cancer. the productive patient was having productive cough from last 3 months he was having a complaint of uh, mild chest pain then shortness of breath which became worsen on exertion or walking or simply going to toilet uh, then feeling tired or weak the patient was uh, uh, having dizziness and sudden onset of vomiting uh, next slide please 
so the presenting complaint when he came to our hospital the patient has a complaint of productive cough change in the gait and dizziness and sudden onset of vomiting since one and a half year back he gives the history then patient uh, breathing difficulty and shortness of breath was present since one year patient went to a private hospital and underwent chest x ray and mri for chest and ct scan of brain where he was diagnosed with the with carcinoma of lung and mats in the brain for further treatment he was referred to the one of the nearby hospital jolly grant himalayan institute where he was providing treatment but later on the family relative take the uh, uh, take a decision that uh, we should come to the aims rishikesh for the management so patient came to our facility on 15 july 2022 next slide please. patient has other uh, clinical manifestation li like patient was having ataxia gait change from one and half year uh, and then vomiting and nausea was the main uh, pro other problem the patient was having and uh, patient don't have any history of any cardiovascular disease and their lung cancer was diagnosed before coming to aims like uh, in december it was diagnosed and then investigation he came with like cbc electrolyte chest x ray ecg lung uh, lung function test and fine needle uh, uh, aspiration uh, uh, cytology and no history of tb asthma jaundice and allergy in la, uh, previous years so patient uh, on phys general physical examination physical and general examination of patient if you'll see patient has a high grade fever like 102 sudden drop of bp like 54 by 30 34 with increased breathing difficulty like spo2 of my patient was like when he came to hospital like 60, it was around 60% then cardiovascular like uh, pulse was regular and s1 s2 sound present and in respiration bilateral air entry was present but reduced vesicular sound in the left lung area because the patient were having left lung cancer then abdomen it was non tender no hepatomegaly no splenomegaly no ascites no muscle wasting was uh, muscle wasting was present because pa patient uh, attendant they give history like that uh, that patient lose around 15 kg weight in within 2 3 months then limb upper and lower limbs uh, are normal genital urinary no uh, abnormality was present and serum pro uh, calcitonin level was like 0.27 it's like significantly high so it is a indication like patient was having some bone mats or something mm -hmm. next so this is like x ray of this patient so there is a significant like uh, white color so almost uh, left lung is fully damaged next slide please next slide please ah uh, and ct also if you'll see there's a like uh, like tumor is almost very big size in the left lung next please so treatment uh, for plan for this patient was like palliative rt treatment we will give after confirmatory bi uh, biopsy was done then uh, it was planned like 10 cycle of rt with 10 grade followed by 5 cycle of booster with 5 grade will plan for this patient and then patient was immediately starting like oxygen therapy because he was having breathlessness uh, with the face mask we started oxygen 2 liter per minute then started injection like nor at at the rate of 4 ml per hour and administered the fluids and two transfusion of albumin was there and along with that medication like clindamycin tazer claxin pantop dexa then sodium valproate then calcimex duolin uh, iprevent and uh, uh, duolin and iprevent uh, nebulization was started like four hourly and six hourly then uh, uh, syrup like serenel and muca muca mucane gel was started for this patient so like psychological aspect for this patient was because patient lose job due to lung cancer like uh, since one and half year he was suffering so he was not able to go for the job then looking upset and need support to do the daily routine activity like he was feeling embarrassed like uh, for going to toilet he he need some assistance is not able to take breath most of the time he is in bed so these are the few issues he was facing then patient uh, wife uh, Uh, is a caregiver so she was also sad and tired because she was only caregiver for this patient and it is like for a female it is very like uh, bothersome 
that she is carrying some male which is heavier than her so uh, worried about the child education because their children like one children was 18 years so they were in mostly 18 years or 16 years they were in school so they were having a issue of child education also then palliative team focus on the treatment of good nutrition and adherence to the treatment uh, so our palliative team treatment team decided when the, this patient came to our uh, facility and like they plan some good diet and adherence to the treatment because there is a high chances the patient may not come because he was coming from like 200 kilometer away from Ames so there is a chances he will not come back if they they discharge or they went and focus on the individual as a whole instead of the lung cancer so main concern next please ma'am uh, like productive cuff, uh, main concern was productive cuff, change in the gait because th that patient has a mats in the brain also. Then dizziness, vomiting, patient breathing difficulty was a problem, shortness of breath, that generalized weakness because patient significantly lost like 15 kg weight. So like then psychological stresses were there, worries of the child was also a problem, main concern. Next, please. So, summary of this patient: We monitored respiration, uh, BP, and saturation every four hourly when patient came in January, uh, of, uh, like every six hourly. Then monitoring their intake out output and vitals every four hourly. Then daily pain monitoring was there along with that other checklist like basic care, their aspiration, airway management, personal hygiene, and other monitoring tool like SRS tools. Then daily. Uh, discussion uh, on the round with palliative care team like doctor, nurses and dietitian all were included like what can be the diet, what is the treatment like a uh, treatment protocol we will follow then still with the patient with the patient and with uh, their wife with us and patient improved a lot and uh, like this patient was uh, admitted like around around one month to our facility then start gaining weight and he improved then this patient was referred to the uh, like uh, one of the uh, one of the hospice unit is nearby to our hospital there he referred so patient has responded to the treatment and clinically shows improvement now he understands the need for the proper nutrition and enhanced patient resilience to the treatment so main discussion point like uh, because uh, because of the malignancy the patient was on chest tube so like uh, one of the main, uh, main problem is like uh, we, we teach uh, to their attendant, like caregiver, ki how to care their chest tube and how to make the bag empty and all these like physical problem uh, uh, we discussed. Then finally, uh, financial support for the children, education and family because that patient was a bread earner of the family. So financial is a main concern for this patient and their caregiver also. To connect with the government scheme like Ayushman card uh, was prepared for this patient. Uh, to provide the financial support for like uh, for treatment and other other medicines and all to ensure access to the other drugs for by connecting them with the respect with the respective uh, tertiary care facility near to their locality like whereby they can give and uh, they can get the medicine easily and their treatment also so this was all about my case okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kusum, for the excellent presentation. Uh, if anyone need any more clarification regarding this patient's story, please ask her. Otherwise, we can move on to the discussion points. Oh, I just wanted to clarify if he needed oxygen at the time that he was discharged to the hospice for therapy. Ma'am, actually, uh... That patient was on oxygen supply along with that, uh, like he was having chest tube also yes. because like he started improving, like gaining weight and his echoes was significantly like changed when he came to hospital, like his echoes was too and now he started ambulating and all. But still he was in oxygen therapy and along with that he was having chest tube and catheterized also. Would anyone want to uh, venture a few suggestions for this gentleman who is with lung cancer? 
answer the minimum uh, to be left main yeah yeah now it's clear ma'am your okay. voice was breaking <laughs> okay so i think um one of the things that's very uh, evident is that he has an obstruction in the left main bronchus uh, okay. and he also has an effusion for he has the chest tube so he has two areas which require some kind of intervention and i think the radiation helped to relieve that obstruction but it's something that's going to come again and again and there's also another thing that we have to keep in mind as anticipatory when you have a central airway tumor then he's also going to be likely to be one of those patients who might have hemoptysis later so we will always have to think of addressing breathlessness for him we will have to you're addressing nutrition that's a fantastic thing because if the patient is picking up weight after the infection that post obstructive pneumonia is relieved the chest tube has been placed to relieve uh, to relieve the malignant pleural effusion then this is the time that we try to make sure that we can actually help them with mobility with some physiotherapy very often cancer patients especially if they are advanced cancer patients we don't tend to look at exercise as a part of their care as well um but you know in part of my training with the nfpm as well we've been or you know some of the hospices that we've been to one of the greatest roles is the physiotherapist who will make sure that even the breathless patients on oxygen are mobilized every day because you're still giving them quality of life in being able to do things on their own so as much as they can we encourage them to move and exercise because you mentioned about his issues with dignity about going to the bathroom uh, needing assistance to go to the bathroom so if we are able to get him to the point where he might be on oxygen he just cranks up his oxygen to 4 liters when he goes to the bathroom but can go with breaks and come that in or even just sit on a bedside commode no that will also be useful so the physiotherapy element along with the nutrition i always think of physiotherapy going along with the nutrition if possible for respiratory symptoms and breathlessness where the cough is concerned helping him mobilize secretions regularly um he has a left sided tumor if it's likely to bleed again i didn't mention this but i should have and i'll make sure it's there i'll correct it in the slides is that if he bleeds you have to have him lie on the bleeding side down so we know that he has a left sided lung cancer if he has hemoptysis have him lie on the left side so the right lung will be up and it will not get contaminated by blood so it will give you some time get the dark bed sheets have him lie on the left side give him the cough suppressant give him the tranexamic acid sometimes it's just a small amount of slough of the tumor so it will be an episodic bleed we will be able to tide that over so these are things that we keep in mind even in the hospital because they will have episodes again and again um and yeah the appropriate uh, if need be the opioids for the breathlessness so he could start if he is breathless even with oxygen with all of this low dose opioid 2.5 to 5 mg every 6 to 8 hours would help him a lot with breathlessness as long as he's being monitored in the hospice as well along with a bowel regimen those would be my support the other thing was government schemes you mentioned this patient actually potentially could benefit from an airway stent in the left main stem bronchus so if there is a center nearby uh then that's a thought for a patient uh who is able to travel to a center but you mentioned that he comes from 200 kilometers away so i understand that can be a difficulty but uh you know we will always encounter some patients who will be able to who have the means and some who won't so we have to have alternate plans for every patient so these would be the thoughts that i can add to uh help with his quality of life in some way thank you ma'am thank you any other thoughts from yeah. the others uh, any questions you might have either about this case or any other any case? other government scheme for especially for like uh, ca lung or something uh, is there any separate schemes and all like ayushman is a uh, all around for yeah. every patient it, yeah. it is there yeah, yeah. So we apart, don't have from that schemes for lung cancer unfortunately no there are schemes for tuberculosis but there are no schemes for cancer and there are some schemes for occupational lung diseases even those are not easy to i mean they take a lot of paperwork to get through but because when ild registry we used to do in our hospital also but yeah, so we are not getting any compensation for that or something yeah, yeah no it's it's only something that ends up helping them with get better coverage for their health because especially if it's a workman's compensation you know patients who worked in coal mines and in many different mines sandstone quarries 
they end up getting interstitial lung disease. Um, so uh, the only thing that ends up happening is their healthcare gets covered, but they don't receive compensation for the loss of health to that degree. Um, that is something that there are activist advocacy groups which are working towards because one of the problems of why patients end up with these diseases, is they don't have strict enough laws about personal protective equipment and wearing masks while working. Like and those patients who are working with the ceramics and all, ma'am, they used to get their IRD more and they are not getting any compensation like uh, like in terms of medicine or something. And the, and the medicines are very expensive. You're right. You're yes, absolutely right. So thank you, ma'am. Uh, so Kusum, I have a question. Uh, so uh, the patient uh, and the caregiver uh, knows their prognosis? Yes, ma'am. Because uh, earlier when they came to a hospital, we already explained like they are having stage four disease. So it's like uh, it has a very bad prognosis or poor prognosis. So it was already explained to patient and their caregiver like it is advanced cancer. And <laughs> <there> is... <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> okay, please continue. Hi, so ma'am, it was explained to like uh, explain uh, to both patient and caregivers. Okay, thank you. So that is very very important. You have to prepare the patient, family members, and patient too. So if there is a uh, here uh, as Antonia mentioned, if they are not affordable to go to the hospital, so we have to prepare the patient, family, the caregivers how to take care of the patients. Even if, the, if there is a breathlessness in their room. So we have to prepare the patient family to manage. So we have learned uh, too many things from Madam today. So uh, you always you can go for non-pharmacological management and then if not help, you can go for a pharmacological management. And also, uh, you, uh, now you understand that the importance of morphine. One thing I wanted to mention, which I think I might not have mentioned during my presentation, is if a patient is already on opioids for pain and now develops breathless. So a patient who's on morphine for pain for another cancer now develops chronic breathlessness because of some other reason. Or it could be that that cancer has spread to the lungs and it has now got lymphangitic spread in the lung. That happens with some cancers. In that case, if the patient is already receiving a steady dose of morphine, which is helping to control their pain, the dose for breathlessness is a 15 to 20% increase per day. That's all. So for a patient who is naive to opioids, never had it before, we usually never need to cross 10 to 30 milligrams sustained release for the whole day for only breathlessness. But that's a baby dose for your patients who are receiving morphine for pain, right? Because many of your patients who will be receiving morphine for pain will be on 20, 30, four times a day. Now, in that situation, you for breathlessness, for addressing the breathlessness, you only need to increase the dose by 15% or so. So that's how you would calculate that, okay, this is how much the patient is getting, this a little bit more, and that will take care of pain and breathlessness. So mm -hmm. when we are assessing that breathlessness, keep in mind what is the background pain as well and address both together because all our respiratory patients unfortunately have a lot of pain. When I go next to a patient with COPD, my first thing is I place my hand on their back and shoulders. You should just see how tense and tight their muscles are because they are using all these accessory muscles for breathing. And you just place your hand on their shoulder, you will see that the burden of breathing is there on their back. And that's why I like the idea of simple non-pharmacological things like a hot and cold compress and a massage and a TENS or an IFP by the physiotherapist. It just allows them to breathe easier. There's that, you know, 10% more of air in and out and it really feels so much better. So that's what I would like. Thank you. So, and also Kusum has mentioned about his children's education. So that is also uh, very, very important uh, because uh, he is not able to give uh, provide a good education uh, to his children because of his illness. That will be uh, distressing him a lot. So uh, so I we would like to hear from the participant side. So how will you manage 
if the if you see this kind of patients in your settings so either you can unmute yourself and talk or you can put your answers in the chat box thank you madam uh, maybe one thing that could be done is to talk to other non-government organizations that provide support for children who have such a problem, a, a parent who is very sick. Probably if there are such organizations whom you partner with, then you can include the children on the list so that the man can feel some, some relief knowing that somebody will take care of his children's education. Alternatively, they may be need to have a family meeting with all the family members and uh, together with the family, you try to think about who could help with, with the children because the father is not well, maybe uncles, depending on what is available. Okay, thank you, uh, Antonia. It's a very good, uh, very good suggestion. You can connect with the nearby NGOs and then, uh, also you can uh, try to get donors also. If someone's are help, willing to help these type of children, uh, you can connect with them. So uh, that is uh, on, uh, one of the good suggestions from Antonia's side. Is there any other suggestions? Any other points? Okay, and also uh, you can think for the occasional rehabilitation too. So uh, you can uh, teach uh, the caregiver about the his wife if she is if she is willing to work in the home itself. You can uh, give some suggestions on uh, vocational rehabilitation so that they can uh, earn something from their uh, that uh, small. They can able to get income from the occasional rehabilitation too. So from their preference, you can uh, give uh, give them some some sort of support. So uh, what we here what we do here is Valiant Media uh, based on their uh, interest. We give uh, small money. We uh, donate uh, small money to them, and then uh, after that, our volunteers will be doing the follow. So if there if that particular occasional rehabilitation is helpful to the patients uh, that uh, they are able to earn money because of that uh, particular uh, rehabilitation. That type of uh, follow uh, will be there. So always you can think about the occasional rehabilitation too. Okay. So any other uh, questions? Ma'am, uh, so no more questions. Uh, I think we can wind up the session. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. It's very well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for the excellent presentation. We have learned a lot from you, especially uh, non-pharmacological management and pharmacological management. Uh, always uh, is very difficult uh, situation in, in palliative care also. This is one of the very distressing symptoms, especially dyspnea uh, and the cough and all. Uh, and also, Madam has mentioned about the respiratory secretions and death rattle. Even in the terminal uh, stage, uh, so death rattle is uh, not uh, distressing to the patients, but uh, it, it will be distressing to the others. That family members uh, thought uh, that the patient is not able to breathe freely. That kind of uh, the problems is there. So you have to understand that um, whenever this kind of uh, distress there, you can uh, give a reassurance. That is very, very reassurance uh, is very, very important. You have to um, uh, that be with the patient and provide psychological support with the patient and their family. Uh, okay. So ma'am, once again, thank you. Uh, thank you, Busum, for the wonderful presentation. You did a lot for the, that patients. You can. 
uh, try to um, give uh, the, with that uh, support uh, uh, with the family uh, and uh, you can give uh, that support to the children and a family too. Uh, so if you, if possible, you can provide home care support to the patient. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Have a good day. Stay safe. Thank you, Rajini, ma'am. Thank you, Kusum, for your case presentation. Thank you all, and I have shared the feedback link with you. Please go through it and fill it up. Um, thank you all. We'll see you on the next class. Bye. Bye.